I think I know some guys that would like to see this and maybe participate in it. Yeah. And he was like, this is Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. I will say there's like at least one day a month where I'm like, maybe I should just go flip burgers. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> so tired. What does that pressure feel like watching it next to Terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Terrifying. Like, I love that part. You do? I do. Oh, I love to me, get man. in there. Like you've got to be married to the story. Filmmaking is the epitome of that. Today on The Rough Draft, we sit down with director and cinematographer Jacob Hamilton. With over 20 years in the industry, Jacob is best known for his award-winning directorial debut, Jump Shot. And his cinematography can be found in places like the documentary Facing Nolan, and more recently in Magnolia Table with Joanna Gaines. On today's episode, Jacob breaks down what it's like to work on a documentary for over seven years. He explains his process of prepping for interviews and how he finds the right people to contribute to the story. We talk about the unpredictable nature of documentary storytelling, as well as the importance of surrounding yourself with the right people. All right, let's jump in to our conversation with Jacob Hamilton. So you're a director, cinematographer, or I guess cinematographer turned director. Yeah, I mean, just kind of starting out, I, I, you kind of do everything, you know, when you first enter that world of being a filmmaker. And so you wear all the hats, right. yeah. edit, you know, produce, shoot, direct, all those things. And uh, when I finally had the opportunity to kind of start dabbling in, you know, like a more concentrated thing, editing and cinematography were what stood out to me. I enjoyed being around and then kept getting a lot of calls for being a cinematographer. And then when I was, you know, <clears throat> out there, getting to, you know, be a cinematographer, camera operator, DP. Uh, there were a lot of instances where I was like, you know, I was working with all kinds of different people and I was like, you know what? I feel like I could do this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I started searching for uh, projects, you know, that maybe would be something that I could direct, um, which ultimately ended up leading me to my first feature length documentary. Can you tell me about your first um, feature yeah. length documentary? So, I directed a feature length documentary called Jump Shot, the Kenny Saylor story. And uh, literally that that was the first project that came to mind. I was like, this is something I wanna direct. And um, long story short, I heard a podcast. A friend of mine like curated like his favorite podcast and would do a podcast about podcasts. Okay. <laughs> it was amazing. He doesn't do it anymore, which is really a bummer, but it was a great way to just like, hit all the major points throughout the week of like, oh, this is really fascinating. And one of them was this like two minute, maybe three minute interview with Kenny Sailors, um, who at the time was in his late eighties. And um, I heard it and I was like, this is fascinating. Had no idea that somebody like invented the jump shot. Right, yeah. And uh, he seemed like this amazing character. And so um, did a little bit of research, found out he was still alive. Um, He lived in Wyoming. And so reach out to him and yeah, one thing led to another. We ended up grabbing breakfast up in Laramie, Wyoming, which is where he lived. And uh, I was like, hey, I wanna, I wanna tell your story and not just basketball. I wanna talk about your life. You know, the more research I did on him, the more I realized this guy did so much more than just basketball and the jump shot. And yeah. so I was like, I think there's a really like rich opportunity to tell this story. Like there's just so much. Um, I always compare it. It's like he's stories like Forrest Gump meets Hoosiers meets Into the Wild. Yeah. It's like those three movies together make <laughs> Kenny's uh, life story. So what like caught your attention about his sure. story? Like, are you a sports yeah. fan or? I am a sports fan. Okay, Sports are in, an incredible like storytelling vessel. Right. You know, Kenny's case is kind of a David versus Goliath story because he's five foot seven and played in the NBA and he created the jump shot out of necessity. What you mentioned earlier about when you had breakfast with them and you realized like, oh, this guy's more than just the inventor of the jump shot or even just more than just a basketball player. He's also a mentor. He's also a, like a great husband, a great dad, a great grandfather. Like he has all these other identities that he excelled at besides just the, mm. the, the thing that everyone else wants to focus on. And I yeah. think like when I watched a jump shot, I would just like really felt that on the second mm. half of the film. And I think this is great storytelling. It was like a little bit bait and switchy. Bait and sw- like, oh yeah, sure. It's like the hook it's is like, basketball. Yeah, right. Wait a second. Why are yeah. we talking about his wife? But I was how, like, yeah. no, this like feels like who he is. But you know yeah, what that I think, means? It's like, I think I did my job. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to tell. Like, I think <laughs> yeah. he did a really beautiful job of portraying what I would cool. think Kenny yeah. would be like. I even wrote down like a, a quote that Katie 
um, said that I think like really sums it up well is if you take away all the business, all the media, mm. all the hype around the game and you want to see pure love, like look at Kenny Sailors. KD nailed it. And like, yeah, I, it was just like a really cool <laughs> line that I was like, I think this is what, this is what I would assume Jacob set out to go and yeah. capture. So with. in that conversation that we had, that first conversation at breakfast, he's like, you know, everybody knows the jump shot and that's all they want to talk about, but there's so much more to my life. And I was like, that's the story I want to tell. What does that look like to pursue, you know, someone's story who has no idea who you are. And then all of a sudden, do you just call them out of the blue? How does that work? Yeah. Like, what's the first step? And <clears throat> I mean, every, every story, you know, just how anybody enters the film industry, it's a different story. And then how we approached him. Yeah. Um, I had no connection at all to him whatsoever. And I think just recently, one of Kenny's friends, like somebody that manages like you know managed a lot of his time and kind of helped organize a lot of his archival like had just built a website and so i saw that and hit him up with an email and they were like yeah we'd love to hop on the phone and chat so first was a phone conversation and then it was hey like i'd like to come up there and, and visit with you in person and talk about this just so you can you know try to build a little bit more trust and yeah and so yeah one thing led to another where I don't know if it was the conventional way of going about it, but it worked somehow and he agreed to do it. You know, uh, I, I, I learned maybe along the way there are maybe other people like trying to like kind of do oh, really? something yeah, a little bit, nothing like exact. I knew nobody was going to be doing exactly what I did, but yeah. you know, I know ESPN like ended up doing a feature with him. That producer actually is in the film talking a little bit about Kenny and his okay. story too. Yeah. But there are all these little things. There's like, oh, people are starting to find out like this guy is still alive. He'd been yeah. the jump shot. And I got all nervous that someone was going to like kind of boot me out of the process and I wouldn't yeah. be able to tell a story, but then kind of being, became confident. I was like, I don't think anybody's going to be sharing the story with the same angle that I am. So even if they are telling his story, I think I'm going to be something that's a little bit more unique. Were you part of every single interview that is part of the film? Yep. Did you conduct those interviews? I did. Yeah. Okay. Can you walk me through, like, how do you prepare for an interview? So like, what's your process? Look yeah. Like and um, so, I mean, it's understanding who you're interviewing and what their perspective is of the story you're trying to tell. Um, one thing I learned uh, not soon enough on Jump Shot is like every person I would sit down, I would ask everything, you know, cause you're like, you know, at that, you're, you're so hungry for content. And I would ask, you know, historical things, the people that probably like didn't know any history, you know, or like yeah. really know of certain aspects of Kenny's life. And so there was a lot of like bloated, you know, interviews that we had where I was trying to get people to like open yeah. up about certain things. They said no idea. And yeah. And so it, it's just one of those things where I, I learned over time doing it and making some mistakes and, you know, you want to focus on, okay, this person, they were, they're going to be able to talk about this specific moment or this specific event or history in here. And like, I just really need to dive into that. Yeah. Maybe get one or two things that are kind of more broad in general, but not, not try, you know, I'm not going to be talking with like, you know, KD about the evolution of basketball as much other than like, let's talk about, you know, comparing like his style, Kenny's style with what's going on today. So it's like being just more specific catered to, you know, who we're, who we're talking with and not trying to get everything out of it. Yeah. And how do you go about like finding out, oh, this person might be, you know, an expert on this part of his life. This person might be, you know, an expert on this part we, of his life. We broke it down. Like there's, there's athletes, there are uh, historians, there are people that wrote articles, you know, and about Kenny and newspapers or, or um, magazines and whatnot. So they could bring a different approach. And so you kind of look at, you know, all the different player, you know, the, the key players and yeah. what makes this story. And there are people that, you know, knew Kenny personally, and there are people that don't, they've never met him, but they can comment on like gameplay and right. the history yeah, yeah. and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, so you kind of have to cater each, you know, those questions. So like, okay, well, who are all these people? How are they somehow related to Kenny or no, you know, can speak on this part of the story? essentially you're having to build so many different relationships through the whole process, right? Like yeah. build rapport so that you get the right or the best answer. What's it like building rapport with someone that might have like, you know, all these red tape to get to, like yeah. I would assume like a KD or a Steph Curry. Is that just a whole different ball game, like interviewing someone like that? Um, well, the, the great thing that I was reminded of when we were pursuing, you know, trying to get some active players or 
people that had played recently, maybe they had just retired, was that they all have an obligation to speak on behalf of their organization. So whoever they're playing with, like that is something that, you know, the Warriors encourage players to participate in, in things like this yeah. documentary. And yeah. so we knew that, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing for that, but there's a gatekeeper to anybody at that level and they're really hard to get to. Um, I forget the exact number, but when we were reaching out to like the, uh, the SID for the Warriors, like who was in charge of all of like contacts, he's just like, you're lucky that I saw your email. Right, yeah. yeah. You know? And it's like, wow, like that's crazy. I have no idea how that happens, but I'm glad that you did read our email and that we're here today um, getting to visit with you guys. So yeah, there, it always, there needs to be some type of personal connection, I yeah. think for it to really solidify. Right. Um, and for us, you know, with jump shot, when we were able to get both KD and Steph, that was through a mutual friend of ours that our executive producer, Mary Beth, um, she met the chaplain for the U S Olympics basketball team. And she shared an early version of jump shot with him. And he's like, this is amazing. I think I know some guys that would like to see this and maybe participate in it. And he, yeah. and he was like that, you know, is Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. So let me see if I can get this in front of them and work something out. And so that's how that came about. So it, there's multiple layers and steps to get to that point, but eventually, yeah, it all, yeah. We got, we got to do it and it was incredible. And we're so <laughs> grateful that we were able to get those guys, you know, amongst everybody else in our film, you know, we got to visit with Dirk, um, which was really fun. And, you know, the late great Bob Knight. So yeah. I don't know, there, there's so many, it's such a wide variety of people in this, you know, from young and old, um, they get to to reflect upon Kenny's legacy. It's it's really exciting. I hope yeah. it makes it well-rounded story. And that speaks to the value of having, you know, a team help you accomplish those things too, because just having people that are out there yeah. like batting for you. Yeah. So you mentioned that she showed him a early version of jump shot. What does that mean? Like a, is this like a paper cut? Is this like a rough, like fully fledged? Like yeah. Rough cut? Great Short, question. Yeah. Like this was a, uh, this was a full cut just minus those few characters that we were searching for. So we had reached the point where we're like, okay, this is a solid film, but we really need some like younger voices, some recognizable faces in here. So okay. we kind of were like, who are the top shooters of all time? Yeah. And, you know, Kevin and Steph are obviously on that list. Right. And the crazy story is that with KD, we actually had an opportunity to go screen the film personally with him. Oh, really? for him to like watch it and see if he wanted to be a part of it. And so we actually went out to like the Bay area with the chaplain, my produce, my two producers and myself. And we like walked up to Katie's house and like rang the doorbell and he came and gave us all hugs. And he's like, let's go, you know? And like, it was just one of the wilder experiences <laughs> of my life. And he's like, let's watch it. You know, we're hanging around outside and um in his backyard and he's like let's let's watch this thing and he we watched it and like his i was just kind of waiting for him to you know start looking around and <laughs> get bored or something like that but he was like glued really? to the screen the entire time that's awesome and uh, at one point in time he like hit pause he's like how do i stop this you know and he's like i'm i am doing this exact same thing today but kenny was doing this like 50 60 years ago um, and so, yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible that he appreciated, you know, you yeah. just never know, like if somebody younger, you know, is going to appreciate, you know, who has come before them. And Katie is one of those guys that, you know, and Steph and, you know, they're all guys that, you know, want to help preserve the history of the game. What does that pressure feel like watching it next to terrifying, yeah, <laughs> terrifying, like having some, oh, like like some, like we were watching it outside on my laptop. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, surely there's a big TV in here that we could be watching this on, but he just like wanted to watch it outside. So it's like, there are dogs barking. There's like planes flying over. I blew out the speakers to my laptop. I'm pretty sure that night my laptop never like performed the way it, it did prior to that. So, but it all worked and he like agreed to be in the film and yeah, his presence is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Right? That's awesome. I've, you know, I've done documentary storytelling on a much, much smaller level, <laughs> like a five minute story. Um, and even that involves, you know, so many interviews, so like many hours of, you know, prep for, for those interviews, but then also so many hours of interview footage plus hours of B-roll. Yeah. 
And then for you, plus hours of archival footage, like, do you have any idea of how much volume of interviews or all of that stuff there was like to sort through? I and, like, meant to look this up before I came in, but I want to say we probably had somewhere around 30, maybe or 40 interviews. And we only used maybe half, you right. know, a lot of people yeah. didn't make, just make it in there for whatever reason. Um, and then the archival side of things, thankfully Kenny's wife saved everything, newspaper clippings, magazines, photos, you know, and I made this film over a seven year period. So like, it was like very touch and go off and on. And there was one point in time, I remember I, I went up there in the uh, University of Wyoming, <clears throat> their, the archival facility attached with the university, they had, I think, seven boxes of Kenny archival material that mm -hmm. his wife had, had saved. And, and it took me a full five days of scanning images, like 12 hour day. Yeah. Like I get there right when it opened and when they would close, we had somewhere around 600 clips like art, like actual, like whether like it's footage. A assets yeah, okay. Got it. in the film, yeah. which, you know, uh, the, the firm that was clearing all of our, you know, um, legal side of things were like, this is like one of the most extensive, uh, archival asset, like lists that we've ever dealt with. Um, but so much of the story took place at that time. And, you know, uh, Kenny can only do so much when he was in his nineties. Thankfully we got him like actually shooting for us, which is incredible. Yeah. We were talking about how we love like that opening shot, even of him just like walking in and first take. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. First take. I had no idea what he was going to do. Had no idea what he was going to do. What did do. you like? What direction did you give? I him just said, Hey Kenny, we're going to have a ball at the top of the key. Just walk in through these doors and take a shot and we're going to film it. You know, we have a Y, we have a tight and uh, we just sit on the one wide the entire time. It was just a great opening. And I'm, and I'm on the tight lens. So I'm only, I'm actually only following the ball. Like I'm like, have a close up of the ball and I'm not even seeing what's happening. And all I, I just hear like a big bounce and it goes in and then everybody started laughing. I'm like, what just happened? He's like, he just bounced the ball in through the hoop. It was perfect. First try. First try. And take I was like, that, well, dude, we, perfect. yeah. And it's like, well, <laughs> maybe we should do one more take just in case we didn't need to. But you know, I was like, uh, it's always scares me to just do anything once. But yeah, that was the first take that had happened. And that's the clip we use for the opening of the film. What's the process look like for someone trying to tell, you know, a documentary story? I'm still a, I'm, I guess I'm kind of old school. Like I'm a paper guy. So like I took the, all, of, all of our transcripts and printed them out so that I could like take notes, highlight. And I had like a Kenny Sailor's Bible basically. With, it ended up being like three binders, I think, with like all of our um, all of our interviews. And I would just go through and <clears throat> highlight them all, read them, have my notes that I could always refer to. Different colors of highlight highlighters meant different things. Like this is a personal story. This is a basketball centric thing. This is, you know, whatever. And so like, you know, I'd be able to look at a page and be like, okay, we're talking about basketball on this page. And I'd make a note at the top of the page of like, here are like the three things that are there. So I could kind of flip through and know that Kenny's talking about his wife or he's talking about playing the NBA or whatever. So, you know, try to just anything I could do to kind of like speed up the process to look through things. Uh, and then, you know, from a digital perspective of it, you have, you know, all these open up in a document and now it's different today because all these different editing software, like you can actually, a lot of them, you can search through transcripts right. now within the program. Yeah. I didn't have that luxury at that time. Yeah. And so I, ha I would have like a word document open and I would, do keywords, Give you know? Yeah. And find, you know, I need somebody that says this, you know, and would search for that and scroll through all the different responses and kind of begin to piece things together. But yeah, I mean, it started out with like, we had a, like a, a paper edit, build that out and realize we need a lot more work. Um, and, uh, but you, you know, you know, the story beats that you're trying to tell. Like I knew, like, you know, you look at the three acts that make up a film and I knew like most of these things probably fell within you know, this act here or there. Um, and then, then you're just trying to like bridge everything together, you know, um, mm -hmm. have some kind of smooth transition where maybe this is an opportunity for like a verite moment, um, a, some B-roll, like a historical, you know, significant moment. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a process and, you know, and, and 
we did lots of uh, test screenings with the film as well to see, you know, what's working, what's not working, who do you want to see more of, who do you think you need to hear less from, like, um, and all that, you know, it's just so many steps. It's so many processes um, and so many individuals that contribute to get you to the finish line um, of that. So I'm pretty sure that uh, we actually had like a 88 minute film and like literally like cut 11 minutes, like last minute. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> just like things that like, I, you know, a couple of people that I trusted were like, I think it's just a smoother transition if you just go from here to there and eliminate some of these things. And I'm sure I pushed back some on it, but ultimately I was like, you're right. We're going to cut that and move on. Those last few minutes are always the hardest to cut. Like, mm -hmm. because as that, you know, piece starts to take shape, it's hard to imagine it being any different and like seconds become hard to cut because it's just like, I love that part. You do? I do. Oh, I love to me, get man. in there and oh, like, I mean, it's like this frame here, that frame there and it's grueling, Yeah, but it's so satisfying to me. Sure. Like yeah. we had, we had an editor um, come on that helped kind of get things going and then uh, we're an independent doc. So I had to take the reins and finish the film. Yeah. Um, and thankfully I have an editing background, but had a lot to learn still. Um, and then had another person come on as a mentor slash story uh, producer um, that would sit in with me and help me shape the story even further. Uh, just grateful for everybody that came together to help make it as great of a story as it is. Yeah. I mean, there's countless hours that collectively went into this thing. You know, I can't even imagine how, how many that would be. I but. was, yeah. When I, when this premiered, I think I was 35 years old and it took me seven years to make. And that's one fifth of my life <laughs> that I worked on this one project. Um, and so I was ready to be done, but it was also like kind of surreal and, you know, you kind of more in closing a chapter um, yeah. like that. So, yeah. And I think like, and I'm speaking for myself, but I would assume there's, you know, several people like me that are also creatives. I feel like I tend to just dream a lot and I'll have like, oh, this is a great idea that I could pursue. But like, I'd never follow through with them because I, I just dream. And then I hit like this cliff of like, I could either pursue it and that's going to mean sacrificing a lot of things or, you know, potentially risking certain things, whether that's finances or time or um, even a job potentially. Like you spent seven years of your life on this story. Like, what does it look like to push past that cliff of like, all right, I'm just, I'm going to commit and this is going to become something that I actually chase and pursue. So great question. The project started out as a short film. So I wanted to create a proof of concept. When did you, like, how long did that short take? Maybe like eight months, nine months, I think. Um, so, you know, and we went up there knowing we wanted to like capture as much with Kenny, like his main interview as possible that we would be making a feature documentary. <clears throat> And so we had that to hang our hat on. Um, and from there, we used that to like pitch and raise money and apply for grants and whatnot. And so there were several hurdles that we had to, had to clear to keep the thing going. But um, there were a lot of times where I was like, I don't know if this is ever going to get completed, but I really did feel like this is, this is the story that I need to tell. Like, yeah, I, I tell people, if you're going to do a feature documentary independently, you know, where you're having to figure everything out, like you've got to be married to the story. Like, it's just one of those things, like you have to be fully committed to it because nobody else is going to help you finish it. Like it's, it really does, you know, rely upon you. People can help, yeah. but like you are the one that's going to have to, to, to finish, you know, pushing that boulder up there and, and rally people to come behind you. I, I just was like, I've got this. And then at some, at certain, at a certain point you get so far down the road, you're like, I can't give up now. Yeah. Like, you know, like, and I, re I remember having that moment. It's like, okay, like this is actually happening. Like yeah. we're doing this. Um, but there's little victories along the way. I think that keep you, you know, that propel you forward. Yeah. Um, we, you know, I got, I was a recipient for the, the Austin film society grant. That was huge. Okay. Um, and then there's a couple other grants that we won. Um, Wyoming had a film grant, uh, at one point in time and we applied to that and we were the ones that received it. So all those things kind of help keep the project alive and moving forward and, uh, and then allowed us to get to the point where we actually got to, you know, actually raise some capital by yeah. meeting with investors and 
actually get everything we needed to finish the film. So it just took a long time. <laughs> There's so much process that, and like dedication and like life that gets breathed into these projects mm. that viewers just don't think about. Yeah. And like, why should they? But like, this is like, be, was seven years of your life and it's an hour of someone else's life, yeah. you know? And so yeah. was this like your full-time job for those seven years? Did you like, no. were you working a full-time a gig or like doing, you know, other things to create a full time income. And this was yep. just like a side project for those seven years. Yeah. And, or Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm a contractor freelance. I would just go and do whatever project I was called to go do. And then I'd come home and then I'd come back and work on jump shot. <laughs> um, and uh, so just part, that's another reason probably why it took a little bit longer because yeah. it was just kind of me, Special you know, project, like puttering my yeah. way through, but uh, but yeah, so yeah, no, I did both. And, you know, there was like, I remember there was like the slowest season of my career. It felt like there was like a two or three month window for whatever reason at the beginning of the year once where I was like, nobody's calling me. I am yeah. not working. And I think like the fact that I was at least productive on editing jump shot at that time, like maybe that's how I was able to keep my sanity and yeah. be like, at least I'm doing something. I'm not just sitting here twiddling my thumb. So um, like I remember making like great strides in the story at that point in time yeah. too. Going back to like the transcripts, I would imagine that you're building paper cuts this entire process through the whole seven years. You're just continually adding interviews to it. Is that like, yeah. Once you get to a certain point, you know, the story's there and you're like, how can we make these scenes, these moments better? And it's like, we need somebody talking about this or we need somebody that has this type of clout or perspective you know, to enhance what's being talked about. And so like you, you get to go in like, um, very, you know, surgically as you get near the end of like, we need to talk, you know, these people need to be saying these things. Yeah. And so you kind of hone in on what your questions are and you know exactly where you want to drop them in. So once the story has taken shape, you're able to like move a little bit more quickly and, yeah. and drop those in. One thing I've admired and respected about you since I've known you is just the way that you like intentionally care for people and just like love people well and are like, genuinely interested in just how people are doing. And so I think like, what is it like to care for the person more than your dream? How do you like steward that relationship? Well, whenever you're sharing yeah. someone else's story. I mean, I, I think it's, thank you for saying that and noticing, you know, I guess that characteristic about me, I think it's something that just comes naturally to me, hmm. which just benefits me as a filmmaker, yeah. a documentary filmmaker specifically, but I've seen it carry over elsewhere. But I, I, I don't know. You just pay attention to like what's going on. And like, you might think you have the best way. And a lot of times it's not, not always, you know, yeah. the best case, you know, for, for them, for whatever reason. And with documentary filmmaking, like you just never, you can plan and, you know, as much as you want to, you know, and it's hardly ever going to go exactly how you imagine. So you've got to roll with the punches. You yeah. got to be flexible with like, okay, well that didn't work. So we're going to think of something else. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I love this career is there's, a, it's just an endless amount of problem solving. Um, a lot of people might not know. I actually studied engineering. I got a degree in engineering, didn't study film. That was something I was doing along, you know, while I was in school. And, uh, but like problem solving is something I just absolutely love, you know, maybe it's a love hate thing, but yeah. like, it's something I appreciate, <laughs> yeah. um, and always am willing to think through like, okay, this isn't working. Like, how can we make this work? Yeah. Um, and press on And filmmaking is the epitome of that, where you're constantly having walls and hurdles and obstacles like thrown in front of you and you're having to figure out, and that's from like a lighting perspective. That's from a logistics perspective. That's from a story perspective. That's from a relationship perspective. Like yeah. there's so many things that make up that have to align to be able to do what we do as filmmakers. Um, and so you, you, you can't just freeze and stop and give up, you know, like you have to like keep pressing on and figure out like, okay, like this isn't working. How are we going to get through this? What do we need to do? And I would say probably even to another level with documentary filmmaking, because especially with someone who's, you know, still living and you're telling their story, like it's an ever evolving story, even like as he, or as his friends are trying to push his name through the hall of fame and like get his name on the ballot. Mm -hmm. That's probably developing while you guys are yeah. walking alongside him. We didn't so know. Yeah. Like, we had no idea. You know, we knew that there was a, a push 
Um, and that's, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing of like, I had this perfect plan. Like to, we, I was up in Wyoming, like during the hall of fame announcement. And, uh, I wanted to have like all of the university, you know, people like the athletic people that are in the film. I wanted to have everybody together watching it live yeah. and like nobody wanted to get together and watch it. And I was like, well, this sucks. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Uh, and, uh, you know, we have the recording of it. And uh, I see it happen. He doesn't get in. And Jim Brandenburg, one of the former coaches at Wyoming, um, I saw that he was calling me. And I thought maybe he just watched it. And, you know, and so I just turned on my camera and held our boom mic up to the phone, like on speaker, and got this raw moment of his frustration and disappointment. Yeah. So you don't see anybody. But you can like just that one moment, I think embodies everybody's feelings of like, God, we, we just gave it everything we had and it still wasn't enough. Yeah. And, uh, that's one of those moments where I, you know, I had to think on the, on the spot and that was the best thing that was given to us. And I can't imagine it any other way. It's perfect, you know? So yeah, just serendipitous that that all played out the way it did. Yeah. Are there any other like lessons that you learned through that process that you now, you know, maybe implement or avoid or like mistakes that you made that mm. have influenced the way that you approach new projects, yeah. whether that's directing or, you know, um, great. Oh, there's so many, so many lessons learned over the years. Um, and for this project in particular, I mean, I think from like a technical standpoint, I think it's really important to like edit as you go. And it, I think it kind of takes the load off like later on to like, so, you know, maybe get a couple interviews in, but like start kind of piecing together what you have because yeah. it allows you to shape the story as you go, but also know what you don't have, what you need um, and whatnot. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and then, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years now, which is crazy to think about. I've been, you know, contracting out as a filmmaker um, be nice to everybody because <laughs> yeah. you never know, you know, what intern is going to be like the, a director or producer you're working for. I'm yeah. serious. It's happened. Yeah. It has happened. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's always important to be kind in my opinion and yeah. show respect to everybody. But like, this is a case and it's like a perfect case and instance where it's like, yeah, like somebody that was probably like low, in on the, you know, production totem pole is now calling the shots on something that you're working for. And, you know, if you treated that person poorly or terribly, like, yeah, maybe you won't get that job, you know, if your, your name is in the hat for it. So, um, I don't know. Those are two things that come to no, mind. No, that's good. I mean, <laughs> and it, it's, it's off, honestly speaks into something that I wanted to talk about, which is like, um, again, just like relationships are a big part of, you know, I mean, any job that you have, but like working on set with other people, you're going to have a lot of frustrations and it's going to have to be like on a time crunch and mm. you're probably going to be like hot and sweaty and like frustrated with like something that didn't go the way that you wanted to go. And so like surrounding yourself with the right people usually kind of helps make that a little different. <laughs> like yeah. if you're working with your best friend, you can get either frustrated and just shrug it off or y'all are like frustrated together and y'all already have yeah. like a rapport and a team, um, like a team working ethic. And, and so like, when I saw the credits of Jump Shot, I was like, man, I know so many names. And like, I know that that's a value for Jacob is like surround himself with good people. And I got to see all these good people, like, you know, their names scroll up on the credits. And um, I just like, what's it like getting to work on something that you care so deeply about with people that you care so deeply for? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, like it's humbling because we were an independent doc. Yeah. We, you know, didn't have all like we did not have a large budget, you know, to like really like we weren't able to pay anybody their rates. <laughs> and so we had people that like basically, you know, were coming out and doing a favor. You know, I, I always was like, I'm gonna pay you something. It's just not gonna be what your time's really worth. That's yeah. not how I see you or value you, but this is just what the circumstance is right now. And, you know, thank you for giving us your time and yeah. sacrificing that to make it happen. So it's, a, it's incredibly humble to, to have people, you know, see something in you or the story where they're willing to say, you know what, that's fine. Like yeah. I'll work at 
you know, half the rate I normally would work for or whatever, or donate, you know, this gear to help you, you know, see your vision. And, you know, that's something for me too. Like whenever young filmmakers or somebody has a passion project, you know, I always, I have, I mean, I'm a cinematographer. I direct now too, but like if a friend calls and they're like, I need a, like everybody's booked. I need a gaffer. I need somebody to help me with, you know, the electric side of things or, uh, I need a camera operator. I want somebody that I can trust. That's going to be an awesome B cam. Like I'm like, yeah. call me, let me know. Like I, I, there's no ego. Like I love to be on set. I love to work with friends and I like to return those favors too. Um, and so if somebody has a passion project and they like, can't pay me like what my normal rate would be, like if I'm available and I have the time to do it, like I'm, I'm hundred percent in like, yeah. That'd be so much fun. I just, I don't know. I just love being on set. I love getting to work. I love the relationships. Um, and I love the creative process and being a part of it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I think just even your answer and I mean, so many other things that speak into just like your love for people and your love for filmmaking. And it's just like seeing those two things come together is just, it seems like it's a joy for you. And I think that kind of shines through your work. Thanks, man. No, it's, it's been a, it's been a great journey. Uh, I will say there's like at least one day a month where I'm like, maybe I should just go flip burgers. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> so tired and so exhausted and it's such a grind, but I keep coming back to it and I love it. And it is satisfying. I mean, we're creating something out of nothing, yeah. like nothing existed. And then all of a sudden you have something that you're getting to share with people that like inspire them, that move them you know, to look at life through a different lens and, yeah. uh, open up to a world that they never knew. And like, that's such an amazing gift to be able to get to be a part of that. So I think yeah. that's probably like why I keep doing this. Cause there is that satisfaction of, of getting to like inspire others. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You're a dad now. Yeah. So you have two kids. Yep. Briggs is about to turn three. Yep. Till he is uh, nine months. Nine months. Yeah. Okay. I imagine that probably spills over into like you being a dad now, like inspiring others. Like I'm sure that you want to be this inspiration for them. I'm putting words in your mouth. I'm assuming this is probably yeah. the case. This is how I feel yeah. as a dad. Um, but for me, like whenever I, whenever we were pregnant with our first um, Judah and, you know, I was kind of at this like tipping point of, I knew like a career change was about to be forced upon me as I was like ending this um, temporary residency as a filmmaker. Um, and I was like, do I want to pursue being known as a filmmaker or do I want to pursue being known as a dad? And like at this point in my life, I didn't think the two could coexist. And so I chose, you know, the just chasing after being a dad as like the thing that I wanted to do. And so for me now, you know, like six years later, it's fun and encouraging for me to see, you know, people who are doing both well. And mm -hmm. that like this thing that I didn't think was possible actually is possible. Like our kids go to the mm -hmm. same school. So I get to see you, yep. you know, show up for Briggs and show up for Tilly and what, like, how do you balance those, th those two things well? And like, it's a great what is that question? Like? I don't know if I do it well, <laughs> but I try. Um, I don't know We're I'm learning. Like, I mean, ha being a father of a three-year-old, you know, and a nine month old, like we're still new, it still feels new, you know, and they're constantly changing and what their needs are, um, are changing. And so it's, um, it's a challenge. So my, I, I'll, I'll start with this. My dad is incredible. So I have him as a great model. My father, you know, I grew up the second half of my childhood. I grew up in a single parent home because my mother passed away from cancer when I okay. was young. And my dad was there. Yeah. You know, he rose to the occasion. He, you know, I was the oldest of three. Um, you know, we, he'd have breakfast ready. In the morning, we'd get to school, you know, we'd come home. We had help from like family and friends. Grandmother was like basically like second mother to yeah. us. She would be there when we get home from school. My dad would go to work, but somehow he came to all of our sporting events and coached. Not even just like showed up, but like was coaching everything. Yeah. I always knew like the looking ahead when I was not, didn't have kids, when I wasn't a father, I wasn't married yet, that I want to be there for my kids someday. Like my dad was there for us. But I knew that this filmmaking career is a little bit trickier than most nine to five jobs because yeah. we're required to travel so much. And it's kind of like you get called and if you say no, then you're not getting a paycheck. Right. And so it's like, you kind of have to find this balance of like, what 
projects do I want to take? Like, does financially, does it make sense to accept, you know, this project? Um, how long am I going to be away for? And I want to be there for my kids. And right now it's kind of easy because it's like, they don't necessarily know if I'm gone or not, but as they get older and they like are playing sports or they have certain school activities or events, like, but currently right now, you know, I probably travel, a, you know, maybe around a third of every month. Um, if you total up all the days, um, maybe it's two to three days here, yeah, five days there or whatever. And um, so I'm, I'm gone, like I'm gone. And thankfully there's like FaceTime. So like I can at least have some kind of connection, but it's, it's nothing compared to like right. the real deal of like getting to hold your child and, you know, get them down, read books and, you know, hold them and tell them you love them. And um, so when I am home, I make it a priority to be as fully present as I can be. Like, that's all I can do. I, and, and it's one of those things, like, I wish I could do more, but realistically, it's just not possible. I could beat myself up over the fact that I'm gone, you know, the 10 days I am a month, or I can say, you know what? I'm gone those 10 days. That's just the way it is. But when I'm home, I'm fully here, like hanging out, like getting in the daycare, cooking yeah. meals, reading books at night. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't have it all figured out. I wish there was a way to somehow do both. You know, I, I've, I've looked at many opportunities where I'm like, should I just look at like doing something that I'm just like here, like working from Austin all the time and yeah. sacrifice doing some of these other jobs that require a lot of travel. And we haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but you know, we've, we've got to earn a living. Um, and so, you know, this is the career path I chose and I've been in it long enough now. It would, it feels like it would be a mistake to get out. Um, like yeah. not that I'm like super established, but I'm established enough that, you know, work comes in and, I'm grateful for that. And so I'm going to keep answering that call, but, uh, but yeah, no, I love, I love my, my kids. I love my wife and I want to be home with them. Like now I want to be home more. Like when I leave, it's like, ugh, I have to leave again. Yeah. This sucks. Um, I just want to be home with them, but I'm, I'm taking the, the, the latest flight out that I can to leave so I can be around yeah. and I'm taking the earliest flight out to get back in time to hang out with them and just trying to, get as much time with them. Cause it, as you know, as a young parent, time flies. Yeah. <laughs> like the, it, things change like so quickly yeah. and I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss this season of life with them. So yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really encouraging just to, just to watch, watch you do those things and obviously not perfect, but well. And so like for me again, yeah. as someone who's just maybe didn't believe that that was possible. So it's one thing that you mentioned was you were emotionally drawn to filmmaking or films as a kid. And then one day realized that it's something that you could actually do. What did that moment look like whenever you realized, Oh, I could be doing this thing that I was always emotionally drawn to. Like how old do you think you were? Um, I think it was, I mean, it was my senior year of high school. I ended up getting like a bootleg copy of Adobe premiere, like way back in the day and was able to like, cause like everything we shot at that point in time, we shot chronologically on like high eight cameras or whatever. Yeah, mini DVs. Yeah, not even mini DVs <laughs> yet at that time. There was like our parents' camcorders that they had in like the early nineties, I think. And uh, and that's where I was like, wow, this is incredible. Yep. I think this is something that I wanna pursue. And I mean, I already had been accepted to Texas A&M where I was gonna be studying engineering. Didn't know any filmmakers. So I was like, well, I mean, I don't see how I'm going to do this as a living, so I should probably get a degree. But my counselor was like, look, I know the guys at the athletic department. There's a 12th Man Productions. Yeah. Like, this would be a great opportunity for get, you know, some professional cameras, learn to edit, be on a, work on a TV show and whatnot. And so really grateful that she brought that to my attention because I ended up working there for about two years until I was like burnt out of dealing with sports. Cause yeah. when you work in sports, you're only working like Friday, Saturday nights right, exactly. when everyone's going out <laughs> having a fun time, but you're logging footage until <laughs> 2 AM in the morning. But yeah, like it was just all these little things that kind of snowballed where, you know, there was only one other filmmaker at a and at that time, because you know, these little cameras that we all carry around with us today didn't exist. Um, and he and I both owned a Panasonic AG DVX 100 shot mini DVs, but it was the first like 
prosumer camera that shot 24 frames per second that gave it this filmic look, the cinematic look that you could not achieve on any other camera prior than everything else looked like would have been on the news or a soap opera. Met another guy who was uh, a filmmaker, um, kind of the tail end of, of that. And we kind of all landed in Austin and that's how I found myself here. And, you know, you work with those guys and then you just keep building out, you know, your network and who you're, who you're working with and the common the thread stories. of relationship yeah. again, yeah. coming into the story. Yeah. Um, man, so much technologically has changed yeah. since then. And it seems to be rapidly changing still. It can either be approached in from intimidation or it can be approached as like, which I've been trying to do lately is like, how can I utilize this to make my processes better so that I can be freed up to be more creative? What has been your, like, as you've gone through so much change and yeah. now like AI being just like this new catalyst, like, has, have you put any thought into that or like, have you I'm utilized any? I'm a slow any? developer. Okay. <laughs> I, I haven't, I have not even scratched the surface yeah. of what's possible and how I want to use it. Um, it, it's one of those things like I, I see, I have seen and explored some ways to like where it's a, it, I see it as a valuable tool, yeah. but I mean, it, it, technology from cameras to lighting AI, like it's, it's something that it's, it's hard to keep up. Right. Like it's, it's so important to understand all of those things are tools that help us tell the stories that we're trying to tell in the story like the way we tell a story doesn't change. You just took the words yeah. out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like tech, like the cameras we have now, like, I mean, I've seen so many incredible videos and like, you know, they just shot this on whatever camera with no budget. And it's like, it looks amazing. But yeah. like, if there's not a great story, like what's bringing me to it. And so, you know, it's one of those things, like any of these things are great tools to help, you know, us, be storytellers, but ultimately it still relies on somebody that knows how to tell a story yeah. and be able to interact with people and like have a good relationship um, with his crew and be able to communicate. Like there's still all these things that you do need to assist you um, in being a, a great storyteller, a great filmmaker beyond right. just the tools, the physical tools that you can hold in your yeah. hands. So. Yeah. I'm, I, I was thinking the same thing, just like, the tool is just a tool until it's put in the hands of a storyteller. And like story has, you know, always been what story is for as long as humanity has been around, like mm -hmm. story just permeates and continues to just be this constant. And these tools are just, you know, tools. They're just ways to help us tell stories in a more efficient way or maybe in a different way. Yeah. yeah I think that rings true is like story is always going to be story and story going to be yeah. story. So on that note, I would just love to know, why story is important from someone who, you know, tells story through film. Hmm. Story inspires. Yeah. Story preserves. Story makes you feel things and appreciate life. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm such like a cry baby and like, I'm so emotional. Like I really invest in story. Like, so yeah, I mean, I think story is important, you know, for for perspective. Yeah. To to get to see other worlds that we don't, you know, not I always we always joke around that like being a filmmaker is like having a backstage pass in life. Yeah. Like the places that we get to go and the people we get to sit down with, like nobody else gets access to do these things, but because we have a camera in our hand, we're given these opportunities. Yeah, And so it's a responsibility to be able to, you know, to share, to tell these stories that maybe people would never get to, to hear or experience, you know? I don't know how many people would have known about, I don't know how many people knew of Kenny prior, you know, to Kenny Sailors getting to right. tell this film, but, I knew that this would be a great opportunity and a platform to get to tell his story and hopefully inspire, you know, people in whatever way, you know, however they see it. But yeah. um, to be a, you know, a husband or a father or a, a mentor. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of a, the long winded <laughs> as I was processing that as no, we were sitting good. here. That's good. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I agree with all of that. And, and so for everyone who's listening, um, would you just could 
can they follow you on social media? And like, yeah, sure. Yeah. If you want to, I don't, it's a bunch of kid photos now these <laughs> days, I feel like, but yeah. Um, Jacob Ryan Hamilton is my Instagram. That's probably the one I'm most, um, active on. And then if you want to tune in to Kenny Saylor's, you know, the jump shot movie, uh, that's on iTunes and Amazon to be able to rent. And I guess, you know, there's also another documentary called Facing Nolan that definitely should check out too. That's on Netflix right now. So I was our cinematographer on that. But yeah. Well, Jacob, thank you again so much for coming on today and um, being our very first guest. Like, I'm just really honored that you would take the time out of what has been a busy schedule for you. You just came back from Colorado and you're about to be on the road again. Like, um, man, just thank you so much for, for joining us and Absolutely. sharing all the wisdom that you had to provide. Thank so. you for having me and hope I get to join you guys again, but it's an honor to be here. And yeah, so thank you for thinking of me. Well, that's it for today's episode of The Rough Draft. To learn more about our guests and to find links and resources related to the conversation, check out rev.com slash podcast. That's rev.com slash podcast. Thank you for listening. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of The Rough Draft.